Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this open information session for the Yanjing Academy of Peking University with a special focus on the economics and management research field here at YCA. Um, for your information, this is an online webinar, so you will not be able to turn on your microphones, nor will you be able to turn on your videos. If you have questions at any point during my presentation, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function. My colleagues will either answer your question directly via chat, or they will save them towards the end. And after our three presentations today, we will leave ample time to answer the questions in the order in which they came to us. So for your information, my name is Brent Haas. I am the Director of Admission Affairs and Distinguished Associate Professor at the Yenjing Academy. Um, I will be telling you a little bit about the sort of general background of the program, our curriculum, and some of the um, special activities that we have here. And we will also be focusing more specifically on the economics and management research subfield here at YCA. After I'm done speaking, it should take about 30, 35 minutes, hopefully. Then we'll have two uh, former Yenjing scholars, both of whom uh, studied with us and did their master's thesis research in the economics and management research concentration. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Yenjing Academy is fortunate to be part of Peking University with the full support of the faculty, staff, and administration here at PKU. Peking University was founded in 1898 as the Jing Shi Da Xue Tang. This was part of the one of the late Qing dynasty reform movements, the Hundred Days of Reform. And although, as the name indicates, this reform movement only lasted 100 days, and it generally wasn't considered successful initially, one of the lasting institutional legacies was the creation of Peking University, China's top institution of higher education. On the right, you can see the famous West Gate of PKU's campus. If this calls to mind, perhaps, um, palatial Chinese architecture like the Forbidden City, that would make sense because a large portion of PKU's campus was originally designed as a summer, an imperial summer palace complex out in the northwestern, at the time, suburbs of Beijing. Here you can see some of the other lovely shots of our um, really impressive and pretty campus. I won't spend too much time on this here, except to point out the central photograph here is Jingyuan, this grassy area surrounded by um, some older two-story brick buildings with slightly sloped rooftops. This is the center of life at Yanjing Academy. Our administration and our teaching building, as well as our large lecture hall, are all clustered around Jingyuan. Peking University today has over 8,200 faculty members organized in 49 schools and departments, and these faculty members mentor and teach 43,000 full-time students and just under 2,800 international students per year. So Yanjing Academy is a fully funded two-year master's program in China studies. We investigate and train our students using interdisciplinary teaching methods and training them in interdisciplinary research methodology to better understand um, China in today's world and the changes that have taken place over the last several decades to um, create the complex um, and fascinating place that we call China today. Having run the admissions program for over a year now and having gotten to know many current and former Yanjing scholars, I can personally attest to the statement that we attract outstanding young scholars from all over the globe, many of whom will be future leaders in whatever field they choose to go into. And we're part of a great experiment here by bringing interdisciplinary teaching methods and research methodology to um, master's level education within the regulations and rules set by the Ministry of Education of the People's Republic of China. And when you're a member of the Yanjing Academy, you're taking classes with, living with, becoming friends with, um, young talented scholars from all over the world. And so taking classes together, reading the same materials, having a shared interest in un better understanding China, really does lead to discussions, debates, and you know, international dialogue, both inside and outside the classroom. The Engineering Academy <clears throat> is a residential college model. 
And so for the first year, all Yenjing scholars are required to live together in the Yenjing Academy House, a dormitory on PKU's campus specifically set aside for Yenjing scholars. For mainland Chinese scholars, as well as scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, they are required to be on campus in Beijing for both years of the two-year master's program. For international scholars, they are required to be on campus living in the dormitory for the first year, although they are strongly encouraged to be resident in Beijing for the second year, um, they are not required to do so. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that coming up when we talk about the terms of the fellowship package that the Engineering Academy offers. The language of administration and the language of instruction at Yenjing Academy is English. No prior proficiency in the Chinese language is required for admission. Now that having been said, we are a graduate level, a highly competitive graduate level program in China studies. And so if you already have a Chinese language proficiency or Chinese language fluency or previous study uh, in, you know, of and about or in China, then that's some, certainly something that we hope you will emphasize in your application package. The Engineering Academy has designed our curriculum to encourage and in some ways push Yenjing scholars outside of courses just offered by the Yenjing Academy into to more broadly integrate into the academic community of PKU's campus. Besides the core required courses that I'll talk about coming up, you have at least half or perhaps more of your first year required academic credits that we encourage you to take as elective courses in other schools and departments at Peking University. For most of the Engineering scholars, that will be courses taught in English at other departments and schools, and there are many of those. But if a uh, person, a Yenjing scholar, is a native Chinese speaker, or if an international scholar has already achieved fluency in Chinese, as evidenced by a successful completion of the HSK Level 6, then we encourage scholars to take content courses in other departments and schools taught in Chinese. So in the North America, and uh, to my knowledge in the United Kingdom as well, finding a fully funded master's program is very, very difficult. So we have attempted to solve this problem by taking care of the financial needs of all Yenjing scholars for the two years that they're with us in the program. The first year Yenjing fellowship includes tuition, accommodation in the Yenjing Academy house. This is our, our on-campus dormitory for the first year a monthly stipend for living expenses of 3,000 renminbi per month. That's gonna be roughly 550 US dollars. In the first year, we offer uh, a round trip travel stipend. So a, a flight to and from your home city and basic medical insurance. And this is Chinese medical insurance specifically designed for international students living and studying in China. Now this is a, major investment that we're making in the roughly 120 Yenjing scholars who join us every year. And so we uh, have an academic review at the end of the first year. If a scholar meets our academic standards, and these standards are clearly laid out in orientation and in the academic handbook, these standards include completing 31 uh, academic credits in their first year, not failing any core required courses, and maintaining a certain minimum GPA level. Scholars apply for the second year Yenjing Fellowship and assuming they meet those conditions, they will receive it. So it is a two year fully funded master's degree program. I mentioned that in the second year, um, international Yenjing scholars, although highly encouraged to stay in Beijing, are not required to. Sometimes an internship opportunity or research requirements necessitate that second year Yenjing scholars are based outside of China. If that is the case, you still have the option of receiving a partial second year Yenjing fellowship. For scholars not resident in China in their second year, they can receive tuition payment and they can receive the monthly living expense stipend. Accommodation, round trip travel, and the basic medical insurance for studying in China will not be provided for second year Yenjing scholars if they are not based in China. In the second year also, scholars have the option of living off campus in Beijing. If they choose this option, then the Yenjing Academy Fellowship will provide a monthly housing stipend. 
This housing stipend is sufficient to cover the expense of one room in a shared apartment, but not really enough to cover, in general, not really enough to cover uh, a single full apartment for one individual person. Beijing's rents are not low anymore at all. And in the second year, we also have other funding opportunities that are granted on a competitive basis. These include teaching assistantships, resident assistantships, as well as office assistantships. This allows second year Yanjing scholars to contribute to the Yanjing community in a different way and have a little bit extra funding. So this is an important slide and we're gonna be talking about this coming up uh, several times through my presentation. These are the six research concentrations at the Yanjing Academy of Peking University. Now, we are an interdisciplinary program. When you are here, you can choose courses in any field, as long as it is interesting to you, as long as related to China, and as long as your faculty advisor agrees that this course is helpful for you in preparation for your master's thesis research. But these six research areas are important to you in three ways. The first way, when you apply. In the application process, you must choose one of these six broad research areas in which to conduct your research. And in the process of this application, you need to think about the fact, you know, do you have academic training in this area? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this coming up. The second way in which these six research areas are important to your time at Yanjing Academy is in the evaluation of your master's thesis. So the process for evaluating a master's thesis at Yanjing Academy and Peking University is as follows. First, your, your thesis advisor must agree that the final draft is um, effective and is satisfactory and ready to be submitted for the second step. The second step is an oral defense of your master's thesis with your thesis advisor and other faculty who are broadly connected to the uh, topic of your thesis. This will include uh, discussions and questions about your theoretical foundation, your methodology, your analysis of the data, and your conclusions. The final step is um, two other faculty member, members whose names you might not know and who per perhaps do not know you personally, but are in fields adjacent to or the same field as your master's thesis will need to do a so-called blind review of your thesis document. They will assess whether or not it meets the standards for a master's thesis in that field. And secondly, whether it makes a contribution to that academic field um, relevant to or appropriate for the level of a master's thesis. Only then can your thesis be considered complete and you can move to the next stage, graduation. And graduation is the third way in which these research areas are important to your time at the Yanjing Academy. Because on your master's diploma, it will say Peking University, Master of Economics, China Studies, Economics and Management. So the research area will be visible and will be you know, on your actual master's diploma. This is a master's degree in China Studies, but one of the ways that we were able to work out uh, accreditation for interdisciplinary research methods within the rules and regulations set by the Ministry of Education is by taking China studies and specifying it within a previously defined research area as designated by the Ministry of Education. So the master's, the master's diploma will say China studies, economics and management, or master of history, China studies, history and archaeology, or master of law, China studies, law and society. So we'll talk a little bit more about application strategies and the relationship to your previous academic training and or professional experience coming up in a little bit. I'd like to spend a few minutes to tell you about the required courses that all Yanjing scholars must complete in their first year of coursework at the Yanjing Academy. China in Transition 1 and 2 is a two semester interdisciplinary look at contemporary China. The first semester course in the fall of your first year is structured along the lines of large lectures from uh, faculty in different departments and schools at Peking University 
combined with um, discussion sections, smaller discussion sections of about 15 to 20 Nanjing scholars led by a teaching assistant. And these discussion sections take place immediately after the um, large lecture. Sometimes they are lectures, sometimes we have discussions or debates between different faculty members at Peking University. China in Transition 2, the spring semester version of China in Transition, narrows down the fairly broad focus, uh, focus of China in Transition 1 into a field research semester course. In this course, Yanjing scholars will pick a professor whose research interests mirror theirs. Um, they then, under the guidance of that PKU professor, design and carry out independent field research in the PRC, culminating in a research paper. Uh, China in Transition 2 also has the added benefit of giving all of our scholars on the ground PRC field research experience uh, in preparation for designing and carrying out their own master's thesis research in the second year of the Engineering Academy's program. We also have another required course called Field Study. This is a group academic uh, travel experience that generally takes place in the late fall of the first semester of your time at the Yanjing Academy. For the first four years, we took all first year Yanjing scholars to Xi'an in northwestern Shanxi province. Last year, we took scholars to Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province in southwestern China. So this is an academic learning excursion. It is a required course. Of course, when you're in Xi'an, you're going to go visit the terracotta soldiers. Of course, when you're in Chengdu, you're going to go see the pandas and eat spicy hot pot. But it's not just a tourist activity. You will have multiple guest lecturers met with mandatory attendance, discussions, networking opportunities with local scholars and graduate students at universities in the city where you're visiting, as well as site visits to uh, locations of archeological and or cultural significance and high-tech industry visits, um, visiting um, industries that are representative or influential in that city. This is a very intense academic travel experience that is designed to not only take your learning outside of the classroom, but also take your experiences outside of Beijing itself. The Topics in China Studies Lecture Series is a year-long course where we bring in guest lecturers um, from different fields, all broadly defined as China Studies. These include, uh, like last year, we had a, a professor from the University of Chicago and Zhejiang University do a very fascinating uh, revisionist history of the Warring States period in ancient China using network analysis to give some new insights into the um, battles, the, the battles between different warring states that led to the eventual unification in the first empire of the Qin dynasty. We also had Xu Bing, world famous Chinese contemporary artist who talked about his theory and practice of creating uh, an art that is both Chinese, but also universally legible in an age of increasing technological influence on our daily lives. And finally, we had um, the chairman and former chairman and CEO of China Mobile Corporation talk about China's development of 2G, 3G, 4G, and then how the rollout of 5G in China is going to reshape the marketplace domestically and perhaps internationally as well. Academic writing is also a year-long series of lectures, symposia, and discussions given by Peking University faculty that offers a step-by-step -step approach to conceptualizing a research project, identifying important secondary literatures with which you need to, need to engage, engage and make a contribution, uh, designing your research methodology, analyzing your data, whatever form it may be, drafting and writing a master's thesis of publication quality. This course culminates in the formal submission of your um, master's thesis research proposal that will guide your research in year two. All international scholars are required to take Chinese language at the Yanjing Academy. Um, these language courses are offered by the School of Teaching Chinese as a Second Language at Peking University. We firmly believe that in order to be uh, a scholar of China, you must have the requisite uh, language capabilities to interact with uh, Chinese people, with uh, fellow academics, and to conduct research, whether it's oral interviews, or reading secondary literature, primary sources, etc. These Chinese language courses will take place. Uh, you'll have four hours of classwork a week 
plus two hours of individual language tutorials with a graduate student at Peking University's School of Teaching Chinese as a Second Language. Now, if you have already uh, reached a truly advanced level in Chinese and you're a non-native Chinese language speaker, you can place out of these required Chinese language courses if you have completed the HSK level six. HSK is the standardized examination for assessing Chinese language proficiency for non-native speakers. And this is the test that's used in mainland China. HSK six is the highest level. If you have completed that, then you are not required to take the Chinese language courses. You are, however, required to uh, still fulfill the requisite number of academic credits in your first year. We encourage scholars who have placed out of the Chinese language courses to take at least one course per semester taught in Chinese um, in other departments and schools around campus. Those who are Yanjing scholars who are native Chinese speakers, so those from um, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau, are required to take a second foreign language, a non-English foreign language, for the same number of class hours and course credits. So um, as I mentioned, the courses that I just showed you in the previous slide are generally just about 40 to 50% of your required courses in the first year. Here you can see uh, a small selection of some of the elective courses that are available for you within broadly defined economics and management. On the left, you can see courses that are offered by the Yenjing Academy itself. On the right, you can see other courses taught and schools and departments at Peking University, um, Department of Economics, uh, the Guanghua School of Management. These are generally English language courses. If you are a native Chinese speaker or you have the HSK-6, there are uh, many, many other courses available to you in Peking University as electives. So this is just some of the courses that you're able to take. Now I have to stress that these might not be available every semester. Just like any university around the world, Courses on offer are uh, changed somewhat every year, often depending on the faculty members' research plans, perhaps they're on leave, perhaps they're teaching other courses. In order to find out what elective courses will be available to you, you have to wait until the actual course selection period um, at the beginning of each semester. But this is just what is uh, available for you, uh, at least a slice of what's available for you. I do want to emphasize that since we are an interdisciplinary program, you are not required to only take courses in this broadly defined research area of economics and management. You can take courses in any field as long as they're China related and you and your advisor at Yanjing Academy feel that this course is potentially helpful for you as you're preparing for your interdisciplinary master's thesis research project. Here you can see uh, a very, very small selection of the some of the thesis topics that recent Yanjing scholars have chosen within economics and management. So understanding China's village in the city, a review and analysis of the formation and transformation of urban villages in Guangzhou, the productive, reproductive, and marginal labor of women in China's market economy, poverty reduction and unconditional cash transfers in China, uh, an analysis of potential cultivated meat in China, focus on China's consumer preferences. I wanted to show you just a few of these to let you know the really real broad diversity of master's thesis topics that can be considered part of the economics and management research concentration at the Anjing Academy. Um, this is not a one size fits all program. We are not looking for one type or profile of student who will be a successful applicant. And once here, you are not required to take only courses in economics and manage, management, nor are you restricted into very, very narrow areas of focus for your master's thesis research topic. Back to the first year. Um, here you can see just some of the kinds of uh, cultural activities that our students uh, are able to take advantage of and participate in during the fall field study course. Remember, this is the intensive academic travel excursion. It takes about a week or so, a long week, generally in the fall semester of the first semester of your first year at Yanjing Academy. 
In the background, you see some Yanjing scholars uh, learning the art of Chinese shadow puppetry in Xi'an in northwestern China. In the foreground, you see a Yanjing scholar who is uh, learning Sichuan opera at a tea house in Chengdu. In China in Transition II, the second semester, the field research semester of the year-long China in Transition course. I remember you take a, you pick a smaller class with a PKU professor who's a research area you're interested in, and then you go out uh, under the guidance of that research, of that PKU professor to conduct independent field research around China. So in 2019, we had 30 different groups of uh, Yanjing scholars who visited 15 provinces, cities, and regions around China, uh, conducting their field research for the China in Transition II course. I want to emphasize that this is funded by Yanjing Academy. So we pay for our scholars to go out and do this class requirement field research. In the first year as well, we also have another field research opportunity grant called the Dean's Research Grant. In this grant, um, Yanjing scholars, either individually or in small groups, write a formal research proposal. Uh, we then review that research proposal. If we think it is practical, can be done in the first year, and um, interesting and makes a potential contribution to the field, then we fund scholars to conduct this um, extracurricular field research in their first year. We're also interested in cultivating uh, the professional careers of Yanjing scholars while they're here in Beijing. And so through our colleagues in the Student Affairs Office, we have uh, a wide selection of extracurricular activities and events, generally that take place in the evenings here on campus currently now online. Uh, we have many companies and international organizations who come in to recruit our students for internship opportunities or for uh, employment after graduation. Uh, these are voluntary activities and trust me you'll be so busy in your first year that you really need to be selective about the ones that are most interesting to you. Here you can see one of the vice presidents of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank talking to interested Yanjing scholars about his career in international development. Um, so this is a, a great opportunity for Yanjing scholars who maybe are interested in a professional career and less so in um, continuing in academia. In your first year at the Yanjing Academy, you are not allowed to have an internship. Um, but in the second year, or even in the summer after your first year coursework ends, we encourage and support Yanjing scholars um, to have legal internships in China. Generally, Yanjing scholars are able to find their own internship opportunity, either through LinkedIn searches or participating in network activities or through recruiting, recruitment that happens on campus. But if you're having problems finding um, a, an internship opportunity that is meets your needs and your career goals, then we'll be happy to use our institutional connections or word of mouth from places where Yanjing scholars have formerly interned to help you get your foot in the door. Of course, applying for and being offered an internship opportunity is the responsibility of each individual scholar. Here you can see some of the uh, Chinese corporations going global, multinational corporations in China, consultancies, international organizations, etc., where Yanjing scholars have had uh, enriching internship experiences in the past. After graduation, um, Yanjing scholars have a great track record of success finding productive next steps in their career. About 30% of Yanjing scholars go on to further graduate level study, either law school, maybe med school, or uh, research training at the doctoral level. On the left, you can see some of the top universities worldwide where Yanjing scholars have gone on for further study immediately upon graduation. And on the right, you can see some of the uh, corporations, consultancies, or international organizations where our scholars have gone on for um, their first employment or maybe their next employment upon graduation. Here you're looking at the uh, themes and sort of insignias of the first four rounds of Yanjing Academy's premier ext extracurricular activity and premier event, the Yanjing Global Symposium. This is a highly competitive 
international China studies conference that is conceptualized, organized, and run by Yanjing scholars. Um, unfortunately, the 2020 version of the Yanjing Global Symposium, which normally happens in late March of every year, had to be canceled this year because of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. 2021 Yanjing Global Symposium is currently being planned by our cohort of uh, the 2020 cohort of Yanjing scholars. So keep your eyes open for a call for papers that should be coming up uh, very soon. But this is a wonderful event where the scholars decide on a theme, put out a call for papers, uh, review applications, find keynote speakers, and then the Yanjing Academy brings in the delegates and keynote speakers to Beijing for a long weekend of um, breakout sessions, discussions, symposia, paper presentations, networking. That's a really, really wonderful event. The 2021 uh, Yanjing Global Symposium will be happening, whether it's online, um, offline in Beijing, or a combination of the two remains to be seen. We just have to see how um, travel restrictions might be eased by then before we can make that call. So over the last six years, six cohorts of Yanjing scholars, we have had 656 scholars join us from 79 different countries and regions around the world. So about 40% from Asia, about a quarter from North America, just under a quarter from Europe, and the remaining 12% from Latin America, Africa, and Oceania. So we are a truly global academic community. Over these last six cohorts of Yanjing scholars, um, we have had scholars join us from just under 300 universities worldwide. You can see just a very, very small selection of some of the universities that have, um, from which Yanjing scholars have graduated, either at the undergraduate bachelor level or perhaps with a law or master's degree. Now we're back to the research areas. Um, you, as you can see on this slide, that um, politics and international relations and economics and management have by far been the most popular two research concentrations for the first six cohorts of Yanjing scholars. I would like to point out a couple of things here. The first is that we do not prefer one research area over another. We do not have quotas for um, any given research area. This is this very you know poorly balanced breakdown of research areas is only indicative of um, the research areas selected by the most competitive applicants in any given year at the Yanjing Academy. So we do not prefer one research area over the other and only in a very 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 specific rare situation might a research area be given preferential acceptance into the program. And this is very rare. Let's say we're down to one spot, the final spot for admission. They were deciding to whom we should offer this, um, this spot. If there was a person who had chosen um, politics and international relations and there'd already been offers sent out to 40 people in that concentration and someone had chosen law and society and we only had 12 or 13 people who were applying for law and society, and each of those two applicants were equally competitive in all other areas. Only in that very, very rare situation might we choose law and society or any um, less represented research area over one of the more popular research areas. So it, for all intents and purposes, it will not affect your, it will not be the deciding factor in whether you are offered admission or not. That having been said, this is a highly competitive graduate program. And so, we are not only looking at each applicant's you know, holistic application package, uh, we also have a responsibility to evaluate your, uh, each applicant's academic training and internship or professional experience. And the reason we have to look into that is to set up admitted Yanjing scholars with the best possible chance of being successful at conducting research in the field they've chosen at the graduate level. So if you are, um, we're all talking about economics and management in, in today's info session. And economics and management has the highest requirement for um, previous fundamental knowledge in order to be able to conduct research at the graduate level. For instance, if you are 
uh, were an anthropology major in your bachelor's degree and are applying to economics and management. On the surface, that appears to be a major shift from one uh, academic concentration into another area of academic inquiry. So we're not, of course, we're not going to just look at the name of your major in undergrad and what you're applying to at Yeji Academy. We're going to look into your academic transcript. Has this person taken microeconomics, macroeconomics, statistical analysis, or has this person, even though they're an anthropology major, um, taken courses in business management or um, organizational theory? Or does this applicant perhaps have some internship experiences at a financial institution? So we're going to be looking into your academic and professional training to try to make sure that you have um, the requisite knowledge necessary to be successful at the graduate level in the field which you're cho choosing. I am in no way saying you should only apply to the field that you majored in in your undergraduate education. I am not saying that at all. But if you think that your undergraduate training and your selected research area at the Engineering Academy appears to be a major shift, then my advice to you is to anticipate that we're going to have those kinds of questions and try to address that in your application materials. So most Yenjing scholars over the first six years, um, their highest level of academic uh, degree is a bachelor's degree. W however, we do welcome applications from those who already have master's degrees or law degrees. You can see that the generally, you know, two thirds or more of Yenjing scholars are coming from undergraduate education. Um, there is no clear direct advantage for already having a master's degree. Uh, we will, however, like I said before, be assessing each applicant holistically and looking at um, the connection between their previous academic training, their professional or internship, internship experience, and the uh, research concentration which they are choosing for Yenjing Academy. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about application strategies and our admission standards. So what are we looking for in applicants to the NG Academy? You know, we are a fully funded, highly competitive graduate program. So we require an outstanding academic record. Um, so that, you know, you need to be, um, have a, a great academic record. Now that doesn't mean you, you must only have a 4.0 or you only must have a first class honors. Um, but it, you know, it is something that we highly value. It is not, however, the only thing we value. So we are also looking for extracurricular achievement and leadership experience. So if you have spent a lot of time and energy and devoted it to um, an extracurricular activity, like say um, community service, uh, charity work, um, student government, you know, are you an artist, a musician, an athlete? Do you have your own startup company? You know, these kinds of things. Uh, if it's something that you think has shaped who you are as a young scholar and as an individual, then we want to hear about it. We also will want to think about what kinds of contributions could you make to the Engine Academy community. And oftentimes those come from extracurricular activities. Um, those kinds of contributions can also come from experience in cross-cultural education or a demonstrated interest and commitment to exploring diverse cultures. We are a truly global academic community and that gives wonderful opportunities for um, learning different perspectives and having your own perspectives challenged in and outside of the classroom. So demonstrated interest in exploring diverse cultures is something we also highly value. We are a China Studies program. And so we value applicants who have experience in, training in, um, the study of China. You do not have to be um, an East Asian studies major or a Chinese language major. Uh, you do not have to have studied abroad for a year in China. But if you have, then we also welcome your application. <clears throat> we do want a mixture of students. I personally find that having students who focused for a large part of their undergraduate career, have studied Chinese, have lived in China or studied abroad in China, having that kind of student in classes and living together with students who uh, maybe only at this stage in their young careers have started becoming interested in China makes for 
multiple perspectives and um, differing insights in and out of the class. So we are interested in applications from those who have focused on China studies in their undergraduate life, but we also every year welcome applicants who have excelled in other fields and at this point are interested in making a kind of sort of lateral move into China studies to take their expertise and their training in the classroom or in internships or in professional life in a different field and try to apply what they've learned uh, to the Chinese situation. So uh, as I said, it's not a one size fits all program and there's not a single quote unquote profile of an ideal applicant. Now, just like when you apply to university, <clears throat> to any internship, to any job, to any graduate program, we want a well articulated reason for what attracts you to the Engine Academy. Why do you want to study China in China? And why do you want to do this at this point in your life and at this point in your career? So definitely tell us why you're interested in the program. We're also interested in knowing your career plans. You know, what is it that you hope to do in the medium and long term? And how can uh, two years of China study in China at the Yanjing Academy and a master's degree from Peking University help you achieve those goals? <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay. So now we're going to get into the details a little bit here because there are different, um, slightly different application processes uh, for um, applicants to the program depending on where they're from. Um, for citizens of the PRC, mainland Chinese scholars, uh, the only way for citizens of the PRC to apply to the program is attending a domestic Chinese university and receiving um, a kind of certification for um, not taking the graduate entrance examination in the PRC. So this is in Chinese, so you will get the certification from your home department or your home school at the university. Um, unfortunately, this is the only route for citizens of the PRC, mainland Chinese uh, students to apply to the program. Uh, we have uh, some proposals that are currently under review. Uh, to perhaps open up a different um, line of applications for PRC citizens, but um, currently this is the only route that PRC citizens can take to apply to the Engine Academy. If an applicant is from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, there is an extra application step that they must complete in order to be considered for admission to YCA. Excuse me. <clears throat> Peking University has its own application portal for <clears throat> applicants from the regions of Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. This application must be completed by the same day, December 4th, 2020, uh, that the Yanjing Academy application deadline is. So these are two separate applications, one to Peking University, one to the Yanjing Academy. If you do not, if a resident of Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan does not do both, then they cannot be considered for admission. So if this potentially applies to you, please go to our website and look at the details uh, in this admission process that are there for you. The most basic qualification for uh, being considered for admission is completing your bachelor's degree no later than August 31st, 2021. <clears throat> okay, uh, I want to remind you that the application deadline is December 4th, 2020, 12 o'clock noon, Beijing time. Don't mess this up. Think about where you are, what your time zone is, and make sure when you set this application deadline on your calendar with a reminder, make sure that it's the proper time <clears throat> set to Beijing time. December 4th, 2020 is both the Yanjing Academy application deadline and the deadline for uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan residents to also complete the online application materials at Peking University. So um, you will apply to the Yanjing Academy as a website, yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. If you are a not a native English speaker and you did not attend a university or a previous graduate program, whose only language of instruction was English, 
then you need to submit uh, one of the certificates of English proficiency, IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge, etc. We will need to see diplomas from any institutions of higher education that you have attended and graduated from. If you are an undergraduate student or if you're currently in a program, that's fine. We don't, we understand that if you are a fourth year or if you're in your final year of university and you're applying in December, you will not have a diploma yet. That's fine. Every university will have some certificate of enrollment, an official document stating that you are currently enrolled and you're on track to graduate by before August 31st, 2021. We will need to see that official documentation. If you're accepted into the program, once you receive your diploma, we will need a copy of that as well. We will need official academic transcripts from all universities or graduate programs that you have attended, official transcripts. We will need a personal statement in English, of no more than 750 words, telling us who you are, what you, how you can contribute to the program, why you're interested in Yanjing Academy, where you, what are your career goals, and how you think we can help you achieve those goals. This year, we have a new application requirement this requirement is a research proposal, maximum of one page. So what is this research proposal? It is, you know, if the personal statement is introducing you as an individual, the research proposal is introducing you as it's your sort of academic introduction to us. Um, it's a one page document. We want to see what you're interested in studying while you're here, potentially. How you think about that, how you frame the questions, are there, you know, what uh, other scholars or other books or other methodologies or theories may be influencing the way you think about this research project? So this is a, a one-page document. It can be a formal, detailed research proposal in one page. It can also be, you should also think about it as the first step in a multiple-year conversation with us at Yanjing Academy and Peking University about your research interests in China studies. We want to see your resume or a CV, and we will need two letters of recommendation. Uh, I need to stress this. These letters of recommendation, the formal letters of recommendation, both, but, both must be academic references, and they must be from associate professors, full professors, or higher, or the equivalent. We realize that not every university system around the world has their academic rankings as assistant, associate, full professor. There are um, lecturers, senior lecturers, et cetera, et cetera. We have conversion tables. If you have specific questions about this, uh, you can contact our admissions inquiry email address. But um, this is a standard practice for top graduate programs in mainland China, and it is Peking University's uh, regulation. So must be associate professor or full professor or higher, and they both must be academic references. Now, if you have um, letters or someone who you think can um, give you a good referral, maybe a, an associate, an assistant professor, maybe um, one of your managers in an internship experience or one of your professional managers, we are happy to see those as well, but they cannot replace the two official academic references you should just submit them as additional documents. All right, so <clears throat> that's all I have for you today, except a couple bits of advice. First, go to our website. You'll learn more about our curriculum. You can learn about the faculty members who are teaching for the Engine Academy. Uh, you can learn more about the admissions process. We have a series of you know, frequently asked questions there. Go check it out. I also really, really recommend that you look at the profiles of current and former Yanjing scholars. First, I hope it'll be inspiring to you. Secondly, I hope you'll look at these interesting people from all over the world with all different backgrounds and academic training, different internship experiences, different professional experiences to let you know that, you know, they, these accepted scholars were able to present who they were what their interests were, what their talent and training is, and where they wanted to go, and were able to get into the program and develop fascinating master's thesis research topics. 
So please look into these profiles for inspiration and to let you know, to remind you, we're not a one size fits all program and there's not only one uh, profile of student we're looking for. Now, if you can't find answer to your, to your questions in, our, um, in today's info session or uh, on our website, please feel free to reach out to us at yca-admissions at pku.edu.cn. If you're using WeChat, please feel free to scan the QR code on the right of the screen. Uh, then you can figure out what's going on here. You can keep up to date with uh, some more profiles, introducing Anqing scholars, events, and things that are happening here. So thank you so much for your patience. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting or talking and sharing about the Anqing Academy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And now we're very lucky to have two Yenjing scholars um, who are gonna join us and talk a little bit about their application process, their experience here, their master's thesis research and what they're doing now. Uh, so I'd like to first welcome a 2018 Yenjing scholar, Eric Chen. Eric, would you uh, turn on your, your mic and your, uh, your video? There we go. And thank you so much for joining us, Eric. Um, everyone, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A and we'll be getting to these after Eric um, and Gary's presentations. Okay, uh, thanks, Brent. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eric. Uh, my Chinese name is Qian Shou Bo, uh, and <laughs> this is a picture of myself. So I am a fourth cohort Yangqing scholar. I'm originally from the U.S., and I did an economics uh, BA at the University of Chicago. Uh, at U Chicago, I was involved in uh, a few undergrad activities, such as the Institute of Politics, uh, careers in business at U Chicago, and I was a peer health counselor. Um, and prior to coming to YCA, I worked as a internal management consultant for DHL Consulting in Miami for two years, uh, working on projects across the U.S., Latin America, and Europe. Um, it was actually on one of these projects where we were working with some Chinese stakeholders that I decided that it'd be really cool to get to know China um, and my heritage a little bit better. Uh, working on that project kind of informed me of some of the, the cultural differences that there are in, in working with Chinese stakeholders. And I thought it'd be really cool to, to really get to know uh, China a little bit better. Uh, since uh, graduating from YCA, I've been working at TikTok or ByteDance. I've been working in their monetization strategy department um, and have been primarily uh, helping TikTok establish their business operations in the greater Middle East and am currently based out of Dubai. So, uh, as mentioned, when I was uh, Looking to apply to YCA, I already knew that I wanted to go to China. It was more of a decision of what kind of program would get me to China and what would be the best for uh, the kind of experience I was looking for. And the primary motivations that led me to apply for YCA was the fact that uh, YCA kind of labeled itself as a, as a platform uh, to for, for students to get to know China. Um, there wasn't kind of a one size fits all uh, approach to uh, to either just language learning or just doing research, but really uh, you could go to YCA and make the most of your experience in the way that you saw fit. I saw that as really enticing. Um, also the internationalness of it, so meeting, the new, meeting new people from around the world who are all really interested in China uh, and getting to know more about Chinese history, economics, culture, uh, was really appealing to me, uh, rather than just having uh, people from a certain subset of the world. Uh, thirdly, I, one of my primary goals uh, in going to YCA was to improve my language skills, um, not only to take uh, language classes, uh, but also to uh, take classes in Chinese. And YCA was one of the few programs that would allow me to do so uh, without necessarily being uh, fully fluent and having HSK6. And then also just having a platform to do some new research opportunities in China, uh, uh, tackle some uh, ideas that I had always had in the back of my mind and it's giving me the avenue and platform to explore those, uh, such as cultural identity for uh, second generation uh, Chinese immigrants uh, and uh, environment uh, related issues, et cetera, et cetera. During my time at Yanqing, uh, I really enjoyed several aspects uh, and it really met all of my expectations that I had going in. Uh, primarily was the first being a diverse curriculum. Uh, I really 
enjoyed being able to take classes from a variety of different disciplines. So I entered as an economics and management uh, scholar. However, I was able to take classes in philosophy and history and felt like I really got a, a diverse understanding of uh, China as a whole. Uh, also, again, getting to know fellow scholars from around the world, uh, and then the opportunity to travel. So I think this for me was also really important. In our first year, you get the opportunity uh, to, to travel around China on uh, fully funded trips through class uh, adventures, as well as uh, your own kind of uh, research, uh, research grant opportunities. And then uh, also, as mentioned before, uh, really delving into some of those research topics and being able to <laughs> eat Chinese food every day. So uh, while I was at Yanqing, um, I had originally entered Yanqing thinking that I would want to eventually transition into working in infrastructure finance uh, in the future. So I decided to study uh, mass transit financing as part of my thesis topic. Uh, in my first year, I found a research institute on campus who was working on similar topics and uh, buddied up with a professor uh, to, to really carry out this thesis. Um, but one caveat here is kind of in the process of my first year, I actually found that I didn't necessarily, uh, I, I didn't necessarily uh, want to pursue the transit financing route in the future. Um, I found in my first year that I was actually interested in tech and found a uh, internship at TikTok and, and that eventually transitioned into my full-time job. Um, but I think the beauty of Yenqing was that it allowed me to finish this uh, thesis topic that I was interested in while simultaneously working full-time uh, during my second year. Uh, also, uh, while at Yenqing in my first year, I was able to participate in the Dean's Grant as well as CIT, uh, researching some kind of diverse uh, topics that I'd always been interested in, such as how ethnic Chinese Venezuelan returnees who have returned to China post the Venezuelan economic crisis have coped with their kind of multi-layered identity as well as going to Yunnan, uh, Dali, which is a really picturesque uh, tourist town to see the tug of war between environmental protection and economic development. Um, and then also, as mentioned before, I, I was able to take a variety of different classes in China, uh, ranging from Chinese financial systems and economic history in Chinese uh, to kind of more topics that I previously wasn't exposed to, such as uh, Confucian thought or modern Chinese politics. And then lastly, to, to close it out, um, some of my suggestions to, to prospective students going forward. Uh, first is, I think it's really important to establish why you want to research China and why you need to be in China to do that. Uh, so what is the purpose of, of you going to Yanqing? And then secondly, what about the Yenqing program uh, appeals to you rather than any other program that's out there that could bring you to China? Uh, what aspect of the Yenqing program is unique and attracts you to it? And then lastly, uh, why you, uh, what you actually bring to the conversation um, as opposed to another applicant. So how can you enrich the, the conversation with uh, other scholars once you are actually on campus? So that's it on my side in terms of my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions on there. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, let's, we have a bunch of questions that are coming in the Q&A function. So let's have Gary do his presentation and then um, we'll address the questions after that. And FYI, there are a couple of questions that have been, at least one that's been addressed to you, Eric. So you can check that out and, and get your thoughts together on that. So uh, Gary, uh, why don't you grab the mic and uh, give us your presentation? Sure, well, that's a hard one to follow. Um, okay. Okay, hi everyone. Um, and thank you, Professor Haas, for giving me the opportunity to kind of share some of my experiences. I think it's always a treat to talk a bit about Yenqing and about my experience here. Um, so just to start off a bit about myself, I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Um, so hello to all the Canadians out there. 
And I graduated from Georgetown with a degree in international political economy in 2019. Um, and then right after that, I went to Yanqing. So right now I'm still in my second year um, of YCA and in the process of my thesis writing. Um, so I'll be able to talk a bit more about that, uh, especially to answer some of your questions since I'm in the middle of doing my thesis. Um, so kind of my internship experience of how, what I did, um, I went into undergrad more interested in international relations and politics. Uh, and I did some internships at the US Senate and then with uh, a 2016 presidential election. But then later I kind of realized that econ was more of my focus. So then I started doing some internships with um, Brookings and then with uh, OECD. And that's when I kind of realized that I really like environmental economics, especially with natural resources. Um, and in Canada, we're always blessed with such a wonderful um, variety of natural resources here. And then uh, I went on to do a internship with World Bank looking at China's BRI, a building road initiative investment uh, in Central Asia and in Mongolia, uh, especially with natural resource extraction over there. And then during the YCA, uh, Professor Haas mentioned that you're not allowed to do internships uh, outside of campus, but you can still work with um, academic institutes based in Peking Peak University. And so I had a, a great fortune of working with the Institute of New Structural Economics, uh, which is really cool because it's really a Chinese uh, contribution to the world of economics. Um, and this is a, a school of thought that you know, was created by a Chinese professor, um, Professor Lin Yifu, uh, Justin Lin, um, and it kind of helps to explain a lot of the development economics theories. And so with that there, I helped with projects in Senegal and Uzbekistan. Um, in Senegal, we were looking at special economic zones um, and industrial parks, and we're doing interviews and kind of looking at Chinese companies and, and French companies and their experience over there. And then in Uzbekistan, we were looking at a bit of light manufacturing. So as you know, labor costs in Chinese cities have been rising very fast, especially in the coastal areas. So a lot of these coastal light manufacturing factories have been relocating either to inland areas, so Sichuan or uh, Guizhou or all of these um, areas that labor costs are still lower, or they're going into other countries such as Southeast Asia, and some of it goes to um, Central Asia. Um, and that's what I got to do a little bit. Um, so what's my motivation for applying for YCA? Well, I, I think there are two main reasons. Uh, the first is that I was really interested in environmental economics and natural resource economics. Um, and that kind of made it really natural to come to China and kind of understand it a bit from the Chinese perspective. And that's because not only is China the world's largest polluter, right, emitter of CO2, but it's also the world's um, largest innovator in, in terms of driving renewable energy. And um, if you're into environment like I am, uh, you'll recall how surprised that everyone was back in September when China announced that by 2060, we're gonna go all carbon neutral, which is crazy when you think about it. Um, and that really justified my reason for coming to China and understanding it a bit. And then there's a personal reason as well. And Vancouver, as with many of the cities on the west coast of uh, North America, uh, has a really deep cultural link to China. Uh, I was a Chinese immigrant as well. I was born in China and then I, I came to Canada. And so it was really important for me to retrace that cultural route uh, and understand China more from the cultural perspective. And I think Yanqing Academy is really good in that aspect because um, it offers an interdisciplinary approach. And I could really, um, understand China from field studies and, and all other cultural activities. So talking more about academics, um, I took a lot of econ classes for sure, um, but I also, because of my uh, interest in environmental economics and, and with the cultural links, I kind of took classes in other departments as well. So I took a class that was really interesting in 
uh, Marxism and Chinese thought, um, which is not what I expected. It kind of pitched Marxism as competing with other Chinese thoughts at that time. So talking about Neo-Confucianism uh, in the early 20th century um, and talking about how Marxism was contributing to, to this idea of Neo-Confucianism and how they were interacting. Took a class with the Department of Chemistry uh, on new material chemistry, which is fascinating because um, I think if you look at a lot of this renewable energy research, a lot of it was coming from China. And I would say that Peking University is one of the world's, well, one of China's leading um, institutions for chemistry research and probably for the world as well. And so uh, my professor was doing all these crazy things with renewable energy uh, and talking about his experience with uh, theoretical and practical research and how his material were being deployed um, in China and across the world. And that was just fascinating for me. And then I kind of took um, a bunch of classes in the School of Environment and Sociology and Economics. And um, Professor Haas also mentioned that you're allowed to take English or Chinese classes if you're able to. And I'm kind of lucky because I, uh, my parents always spoke to me in Chinese. So I came in with very good language skills uh, and I took advantage of that. And, took a lot of these classes in Chinese. Okay, talking about my thesis. Uh, so a caveat is that I'm still in the process of writing my thesis and it's probably changing every day. Uh, this slide I probably changed three or four times because in the month that we were preparing and thinking about this, I already you know, changed my approach and thesis uh, that many times. And so this is the newest one. Um, and then what I'm doing right now is looking at the stringency of local government enforcement uh, of environmental regulations in China and industrial energy intensity. Um, so let me unpack this a bit in two minutes. So with industrial energy intensity, uh, you recall that 70% um, of the energy use in China is in its industrial sector. So this is really important if China is going to transition to a carbon neutral economy. And the problem is that although the national government has a lot of incentive to uh, force through these environmental regulations, um, it's not always a incentive shared by local government officials. Um, and especially because economic development is still a very important indicator um, of uh, merit for local government officials. Um, it's very important for their promotion. And so, um, a lot of times local government officials might not enforce uh, regulations in the same vein that national governments would like it to. So what I looked at is that, just to explain kind of these two graphs, uh, this graph shows industrial energy intensity. Uh, so that's, that's um, industrial energy use divided by GDP um, in Henan province, right? So you can see that um, with the blue bar, a kind of over the course of 12 years, it in decreased by you know, more than 70%, which is absolutely incredible. And then uh, this is the changing energy consumption as well. So that's the uh, yearly change. So that's on the, this axis over here. And you can see that um, yearly, the increase in energy intensity has been slowing down as well. Sorry, I mean, increasing energy consumption has been slowing down as well. Uh, but obviously that's at a provincial level and it masks a lot of heterogeneity at the municipal level. And you can see that um, you know, these are all the, I think 18 municipalities in Henan um, ranked by their reduction in energy intensity in 2018. And what I wanted to do was to kind of uh, evaluate what's the relationship between these local government environmental enforcement and I created an indicator to measure that based on um, a number of things. Um, and then I wanted to see how it, um, how it influences industrial energy intensity at the end, um, disaggregated by region, time, um, and by industry. And then um, I'll skip over this. I basically use a uh, DEA method, data development analysis method that's uh, if you study 
environmental economics, it's quite common where you uh, use a non-parametrical um, um, function to construct the production productivity frontier. And you estimate the energy efficiency by the distance between your current uh, energy usage and the theoretical uh, maximum. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, this is just my latest version. Um, I will finish by some uh, suggestions for prospective students. I think Eric already covered a lot of these really well. Um, what I really want to emphasize is just the first point, right? Why China? And I think that um, it's just, just an exciting uh, world right now, especially since China is driving a lot of the innovation and it's bringing a lot of, I think, um, welcome change to the world, um, at least in the field of environmental economics. And I think that um, one thing that um, I would imagine the um, emissions team would really look at is, is your passion and, and you know, your, your motivation for studying in China. And if you can kind of explain that and, and show that, why is it that I have to be in China uh, to do this research? And why is it that I have to do it now? Uh, then I, I would imagine that that would be um, really um, look favorably upon. So um, I think my time is up and then I'll just uh, retire and uh, maybe answer some questions on the Q&A chat. But thank you very much, uh, Professor Haas and everyone. Excellent, Gary. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, thanks to Eric as well. So we have, um, as I've been looking through the Q&A, it seems like we have a few groupings of questions here. Um, some about the um, research proposal, um, some about the degree, then some about the classes and training uh, at YCA. So let me handle this uh, degree, the first question that came in at 8.52 p.m. first, and then I'll give you some of my thoughts about your strategies for the research proposal and how we're evaluating them. And then at that point, I'll ask Eric and or Gary to share their thoughts about it. We have a couple of questions specifically addressed to you about the research proposal, even though you didn't have to write a research proposal, because as I said, this is a new requirement. So the first question um, at 8.52 p.m. is, is there a difference between a Master of Sciences and a Master of Arts and the master's degree attained from the Yanjing program, or are they all MAs? Um, so good question. You know, China has a different, um, a somewhat different uh, education system. And now we are all here at Yanjing Academy in the humanities and social sciences. So you, you should consider your degree, um, assuming you're accepted and graduate from Peking University as the equivalent of a master of arts. So this is a humanities and social sciences program. That having been said, in China's Ministry of Education, the way that degrees are granted is that you have your uh, degree, and then you have your research area. And these are both listed on your official degree and on your diploma, so to speak. So the degree is going to be as the one of the following. So if you are law and society, the degree is master of law. And then the research area is China studies, law and society. If you are politics and international relations, the degree will also be master of law. The research area will be China studies, politics and international relations. For economics and management, the degree is Master of Economics, Research Area, China Studies, Economics and Management. For philosophy, um, Master for philosophy and religion, Master of Philosophy, China Studies, Philosophy and Religion, Master of History, China Studies, History and Archaeology, uh, Master of Literature, China Studies, Literature and Culture, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is so this is, you know, I mentioned Yanjing Academy is sort of a grand experiment in bringing interdisciplinary teaching methods and interdisciplinary research into the graduate system of education in China. And this is how Peking University and Yanjing Academy was able to work out recognition of our interdisciplinary teaching methods and research projects within the regulations of the Ministry of Education. So that's a perhaps a little more detail than you wanted, but I, it's just important to give you an idea. First, to summarize, uh, it's most equivalent to Master of Arts because we're a humanities and social sciences program, but there's the difference between the degree and the research area in China, and both of them will be listed on your um, master's diploma. 
Okay, so we have a couple of questions about the evaluation of um, the, you know, how you should structure your research proposal, how we evaluate the research proposal, and how the, the interview process might go. So um, quickly on the evaluation. Um, so first, um, one, one person, let me see who said this. Uh, um, anonymous attendee at 9 p.m. said, uh, I would like to know who is going to evaluate the research proposal that will send as part of our application materials. Will it be someone from economics and management field? Um, yes. So at the, you know, the faculty who will be deciding who will be evaluating the application packages, including your research proposal, will be drawn from multiple fields at Peking University. Uh, but there will be at least one who is involved, who is you know, in the economics and or management field at Peking University. There will be others who are not in economics and management, but there will be at least one in any of the uh, research concentrations who will be uh, evaluating the research proposals. Similarly, on the interview process, um, let's see. Um, well, I can't find it right now, but in the interview process, you can expect uh, that there will be some um, questions specific to the field that you have applied for. Um, we always try to make sure that uh, we have faculty in the application pro or in the admissions interview who are experts in the field. Uh, now, it might not be an entire, it's generally not going to be an entire interview process focused on your research proposal, but you should, ex you should be ready and prepared to answer questions and have a discussion about your research proposal and that will likely have some series of questions coming from uh, a professor in the area of economics and management. Um, so I don't really wanna to say too much more about the interview process itself, but yeah, be ready to, to answer questions. And I think this might be helpful for me to tell you a little bit about why, you know, this is the first year we did the research proposal. Um, we found that um, over previous years, uh, in the you know first in the personal statement which is 750 words it was very difficult um, to get a good sense of each applicant when they're talking about why they're interested in the ng academy um, what they hope to study here um, what their career goals are and how yca and peking university can help them achieve those goals and what you know what makes them the individual they are all within 750 words. It often also led to um, almost every interview had a specific series of questions on, do you have a potential research topic at Yenji Academy? What is it that you'd like to research? And because we had that formulaic question, um, it felt like we couldn't really dig in enough and have uh, as deep uh, and an interesting a conversation with those who were selected for the interview. And so we want a personal introduction in your personal statement, career goals, extracurricular activities, what you can contribute, uh, why you're interested in the program, and then an academic research-focused introduction in the research proposal. Um, this, we hope, will allow us to have a more fruitful, uh, more engaging, and more probing uh, series of discussions and questions and answers in the interview process. And so on what I think you should concentrate on and how you should format your, your research proposal. Well, it, there isn't a single answer to this because if uh, it depends on what your uh, profile in terms of your academic training and or professional experience and how much that matches up to the field of research inquiry that you are applying to. Uh, remember I said, you know, there we have some applicants and, and then admitted students who are fully committed, you know, China studies people. And so if, if someone majored in East Asian languages and literatures, minored in Chinese language, had studied abroad in China for a semester, that person's research proposal is very potentially, if they're applying to literature and culture, going to be much more targeted because they have um, previous training and or previous research papers that they've written. But we also have 
certain applicants, many applicants who are who excel in something not related specifically to China, like in um, you know economics or like in you know, maybe they come with already with a a law degree, and they have a, a body of knowledge and a series of previous research questions and a series of other expertise, and they're curious how that applies to China. And so that's a different kind of research proposal. That one might be more heavy on, you know, this is what I've studied before, these are the projects I've done, these are the professional experiences that I've had, and I'm curious how my experience, let's say, interning at an international law firm, Will, how my experience there can be applied to understanding certain topics of international law that I know something about in the Chinese context. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all requirement for the research proposal. But we do want in one page, and remember this is a one-page paper, so that limits just how detailed you can go. In a set one page, we want to see what it is you're interested in potentially researching here. How do you conceptualize that research project? What questions are you interested in asking? And what kinds of ways do you propose answering those questions? If you have some scholars or other books whose research is interesting to you or have raised questions that you don't know the answer to yet, you're welcome and we encourage you to put them in there. You do not need a full literature review. You know, this is, this is not a, um, academic conference presentation where you're submitting a previous an already written research paper as part of a discussion panel. So remember that you have one page. Remember that we want to see who you are or who you think you will become as a young researcher. Um, we do not demand and nor do we really expect that what you write in this research proposal will 100% become the final product of your master's thesis research project. This is, um, despite that, we still want to see where you are in your thinking about a research project and how you write about this potential research project. Um, so we will have someone, at least one faculty member who's in the field review, or in the field that you're applying to, reviewing your research proposal. And you should expect that should you be selected for an interview, that there will be some field specific questions uh, waiting for you in the interview process. Um, so I think that's all I'm gonna say about it right now. Um, there were a couple of questions. Uh, I believe we have a question for Gary and Eric. Um, although I know y'all didn't have to write the one page research proposal, I just wanna comment as a, I'm from North Carolina. I appreciate seeing the y'all in your in your question. Um, I know, although Gary and Eric didn't have to write the one page research proposal, uh, this person would like to get your thoughts on what you might want, what you recommend that they want to convey the most if you had had to write it. Would you try conveying a deep understanding of current research associated with your focus, more of your background and how it makes sense for you to study this topic and something altogether different? Uh, Eric and or Gary, do you have any uh, comments uh, to this question? I, I wouldn't want to lead you astray here, but I, I guess if I were to think back of how I had tackled mine is um, in my application, I had given uh, why I wanted to go to Yanqing and so part of it was the, the research project that I wanted to uh, tackle. I think I probably would have kept that same uh, overall structure for my personal statement and then just gone deeper uh, in the actual research proposal as to kind of fleshing out what that research proposal would actually look like. But that's just maybe how I would tackle it. Uh, thanks, Eric. And, and uh, to that questioner, I would say, um, you know, it, it depends on what your background and training is and how it relates to the project that you hope to uh, hope to do here. Uh, Gary, what do you think about that question? I was just gonna say if uh, you can answer that question because I I think that you're best poised to to do that, but you just did so. Oh, are you are you saying me answer yeah. that or the person who asked that question is okay. Um, yeah, so um, to this person, um, 
So I think you have identified in your final question the two goals and that maybe you're at opposite ends of the spectrum here. You say, would you try conveying a deep understanding of current research, research associated with your focus, more of your background and how it makes sense for you to study this topic? I'm gonna stop right there. I think understanding of your, this field that you want to go in is something you should try to demonstrate to us. And you should balance that with um, your training and why it makes sense for you to be interested in this research project. Uh, I dropped the uh, something altogether different because I don't think you should be shooting for something altogether different. I think these are the two main goals of the research proposal required in the application to Yanjing Academy. How you balance out those two depends on what your background is, the research topic that you're interested in. You know, we want to see that you have knowledge in, in this. It does not have to be a, a comprehensive or even a deep list of all of the scholars who have written on topic X if you're interested in exploring topic X. We're not looking for just name dropping and book titles dropping in your in your research proposal. But those are the two goals that you should try to get. Why it makes sense for you to do this research project and show us what you already know about it. So if you're already fully, you know, if you are like I was, majored in history, minored in Chinese language, focused on Chinese history in undergrad, had already taken you know, independent study, learning to translate Qing Dynasty documents. You know, I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do uh, at the graduate level. So I played up my strengths in my uh, research proposals and application materials. If you fit a profile like that, that you've been researching one topic for a long time and you want to continue that, well, then play to your strengths. If you, but you don't have to be like that. If you have been researching something or one area and you're interested in applying the, the questions and the methodologies and the problems that you've identified in your previous non-China related uh, focus and see how what are the answers to those questions related to China, then go for that. So it really just depends on where you are on deep knowledge in this field and your previous training. I hope that answers the question. I mean, it's I, I do wanna say there, I think uh, to this um, person who wrote the question, you've hit, you've really highlighted the two most important goals that I think everyone needs to try to achieve in their research proposal. Uh, try to convey your understanding of the field into which you're planning on conducting, uh, applying and conducting your research and telling us why it makes sense based on your training and or your interest to conduct this research. So uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, so now we're going to go back up to the top, uh, back to the earlier ones, and just ask through uh, the ones as they were uh, submitted. So um, since it is a highly interdisciplinary program, is it possible that the application is referenced to a previous research area, but the, y the YCA's evaluation members readjust the topic? For example, if I apply to economics, but YCA's evaluators notice from the research proposal that is more appropriate to join uh, a different research program like um, Law and Society, would this affect the application? Um, so this is a good question. Um, here's what I, I think I can say about this uh, that I hope will be helpful. So these research areas, as I said, they're only important for your application, your thesis evaluation and your um, diploma. But they are very, very, very broad, incredibly broad topics. You know, economics and management encapsulate so many related, but in some ways distinct methods of academic inquiry and research approaches. So there's an, you know, there is a, an, a description that I've used in multiple of these uh, information sessions. So. I'm making up a research project. Let's say someone was interested in comparing two historical periods of high economic development and high economic influence in China and China's influence around the world. So they select contemporary China, let's say the last 20 years. But they also go back and look at the high Qing period, the Qing dynasty and the long 18th century, 
You know, the Qing dynasty, even as late as 1820, was responsible for more than 30% of global GDP. That's a striking number. So they're looking at the, let's say, the late 18th century and the early 21st century and looking at China's, you know, economic influence with, say, a different, a certain region around the world, let's say Central Asia. Okay, so that broad topic. Well, is that better suited for an economics and management research topic, or is it better suited for a history and archaeology research topic? Um, is it an economics and management research topic with a strong historical focus, or a historic, history, history and archaeological research topic with a strong economics focus? That's up to you. That's up to what you're interested in and what your training best suits you for. If, let's say, you already have a background in, um, you were an economics major in your uh, undergraduate bachelor's program, but you're interested in doing an economics project with a strong historical tilt, great, that is no problem. And we encourage that kind of interdisciplinarity. So in your research proposal, you might say, you know, Here's my training, here's what I've studied, but I'm really interested in comparing these two time periods. And because of that, I want to take more history courses at Yanjing Academy. I have the economics training, now I wanna learn how to um, propose and answer research questions in historical economics or in economic history. To this end, I'm very attracted by uh, Professor Hawke's um, history of, China, of the Chinese economy and these other couple of courses to strengthen my training in historical analysis to work towards this kind of uh, history of Chinese economics research project. That makes a lot of sense. And that I think is a, a potentially very persuasive and very successful application profile and research proposal. Um, now, to follow up a little bit on that question, you know. It is possible, but in my experience here, unlikely um, that we would suggest a student, we would evaluate a student's application package and then say, um, no, you're applying to the wrong research area. You know, we, we don't want to do that. Um, this is about, you know, as Eric said, we want to be a platform for young scholars to explore their interests get the training they need and craft the master's thesis that they want, uh, that they're interested in, that they're trained for to help them take the next step in their career. So we're not gonna say, no, you shouldn't be applying to economics and management. Um, but I do stress that in your application materials and specifically your research area or your research proposal, that you get to this level of depth, like I was saying, a, economics project with a history focus or a history project with an economics focus. That's the kind of, of thought that we want to see um, you put into your, your time at the Engine Academy. And this is in many ways designed to set you up, to force you to think about this now so you can be more strategic in selecting your courses and finding an advisor and then can already have a, a head start on your time uh, at the Engineering Academy, even as you're applying to the program. Uh, we had a, another question here about switching research areas. And I believe Gary uh, also addressed this question um, in the chat function. It is possible for a scholar to change their research area in the first year at the Engineering Academy. Um, and let me give you a little bit of details on that because um, this has changed from the time when Eric and Gary was here. We have been uh, regularizing our process for applying for and approval of switching research concentrations at YCA. So one, um, if let's continue with this metaphor of history and economics, that research project that I just sort of you know thought up. Um, so you apply and are accepted as economics and management, um, but you think that maybe you're gonna wanna switch to history and archeology span as your research area because you're curious about it and you can see that you that might be something you think about in the future. So here are the standards that we will use to evaluate 
applications for switching research areas when they're already at Yanjing Academy. First, and this is absolutely necessary, you have to find a thesis advisor in that field who is willing to take you on as an advisee. So if you're going from economics and management to history, you will need to find a historian who is, will, who is convinced that you can do a good research project and is willing to advise you in that project. So that is, you have to have a, a thesis advisor in order to switch into that field. Secondly, um, we are increasing our oversight of this to make sure that you're best prepared and that you're best set up for success uh, if you switch your research area. And so just having your the thesis advisor in the field into which you're switching agree is not enough. We will also want you to have, uh, it's either a letter or an email from another faculty member in that field with whom you've spoken and who thinks, yeah, I think this is a good project and I support this student moving from research area A to research area B. So this is, we're wanting to make sure that it's not just you and your thesis advisor, that there are other faculty members in that research area who are convinced of in your project and think you um, have what it takes to write a master's thesis in that field. And this isn't just us trying to be difficult and put more barriers up in front of you potentially switching your research area. What this um, evaluation criterion is designed to do is to make sure you're actively engaging with a broader number, a larger number of professors in the field to which you hope to switch. Um, so it, it comes from a, a position and a motivation to um, once again set you up for um, success in your research project. And then finally, we will be reevaluating your academic record, both previous institutions before you get to Yanjing Academy and at YCA. So if you think that you might want to switch research areas, then you should take courses that are related to that research area in your first and second semester at Yanjing Academy. Now we, you know, Eric and Gary both took a wide array of courses while they are here, and that's awesome. We, we really love that and we encourage that. This is how, you know, we're interdisciplinary and that you can choose courses in anything as long as it's related to broadly China studies. But another an added benefit is if you are on that economics track with the historical economic comparison of 18th century and early 21st century China, then it behooves you to take courses in history to prepare for your research topic um, even if it stays in economics and management, but it also has the added benefit of in case you might want to switch, you already have some courses under your belt to help you um, meet the standards of switching your research area. And it's also a way for you to meet other faculty members in that research area to can perhaps give you that, you know, uh, letter of support or that email of support on your switching your research concentration. Okay. Um, so we have uh, a couple of questions that have just popped up. We have one uh, student asking uh, about being over the, uh, the being in, the student is in um, their 40s and has applied and has wondered if they have a chance of um, admission. Um, well, you know, we do not have a firm age cutoff at Yanjing Academy. It's not a regulation. We have, however, not accepted anyone over the age of 28 in the first six years of the program. Um, so you've already submitted your application. We will look at your application. Um, it would be uh, a significant uh, age difference from the other scholars in the program. But if you've submitted it, we will review it. Um, so there is not a formal age cutoff for admission to the program. That having been said, um, we average our average age is about 23 or 24. Um, and this is partially due to the fact that all of our mainland Chinese scholars, because of their route to admission, they all come directly out of their university. 
Um, so they are coming into the program at 22 or so, and we try to keep a fairly um, tight age range uh, so that our scholars, we hope that that'll help stimulate, um, you know, friendships and positive relationships, either personal and or professional, uh, by keeping a, a similarly aged cohort. Um, Someone asked, what is the possibility that a candidate will get rejected in the interview round even after his or her application gets selected? Well, I mean, you know, being accepted, being invited for an interview is not a guarantee of admission. Uh, being invited for an interview simply means you are in, you are a finalist for admission at Yanjing Academy. Uh, I don't want to go into how many, you know, the numbers of how many interviews we offer versus how many um, admission offers we finally give but yes i mean some someone can get can not be offered admission even if they are um brought into the interview round so do not consider an interview to be um admission to the program uh, i have one other question here that i think i can handle very quickly um Eric, you have a couple of other questions coming up. If you still are available to answer them, why don't you, I'll answer this question and then you can uh, address either or both of them afterwards. Um, yeah, so this question is a, a quick uh, overview on the certifications, proof required of internships, work experience, and other activities that require proof to, to, beside one's undergrad diploma. Yeah, so in, in China, um, pretty much everyone who does an internship gets an internship certificate. Um, I know that we are, we are aware that that's not always the case for most uh, or for other places in the world. So um, we just need proof of an internship. Um, like if, if you got a, a, an offer letter for that internship, or if you could um, get the intern manager um, to, you know, send an email that says, you know, this applicant was an intern at our organization from, you know, August 2018 until uh, January 2019. You know, signed that kind of thing. That would be fine too. Um, next, the next step down uh, would be, you know, detailed contact information for your internship supervisor so we could follow up. It just doesn't have to be a formal um, internship certificate if that's not readily available where you're from, but we do need to see some sort of proof. Um, so do your best to find the kind of proof that you think you can for your internship experience. Uh, Eric, do you have any, any um, response to the questions that are there for you? I think Ooh, you're still with us. Questions? Oh, okay, so in the Q&A, we have a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, when applying, how did you think the concentration in economics and management would help you with what yeah. you wanted after the program? Yeah. And was it what you thought you wanted to do? Mm, I guess when I, I think I touched on this during my presentation was when I, I was entering the economics and management track uh, at Yenching, I was thinking that I wanted to do uh, kind of land finance at the end of my uh, time at Yenching. Uh, that's something that I wanted to transition into um, after having worked in logistics for a while. But kind of through my time at Yenching, and I think this is the, the benefit of Yenching disciplinary program, I discovered I had other interests and uh, was exposed to the tech community here in uh, there in Beijing. Um, got to know some people working at, at TikTok and have now been at TikTok ever since. So uh, I'm not doing what I thought I would want to do, but I think that's also the benefit of, of Yenchi, and that gives you that platform to explore other avenues and uh, the backing to do so as well. All right, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, I think we're going to. Uh, um, just so you know, uh, you have inspired someone by your story. Um, uh, there's a question about your major challenge in these multinational companies you volunteered or worked with and how did you overcome them? Uh, this person is inspired by your story. Um, can, you, can you answer that really briefly? Because I think we want to focus more on, um, you know, application to the program. 
Um, I, I think even Yanqing has helped me with that as well. Working, especially at uh, at Dance and being a Chinese organization and kind of yeah, a Chinese organization that's navigating uh, abroad and uh, having kind of studied the intersection of China and how it is, it's kind of international policy and all of that has actively helped me in, in my role right now. And a lot of the, the courses that I'm taking at Yanqing I've actually found quite useful in, in my job now. Okay, thanks, man. Um, okay, so um, we had a question that just came in about community work, which had no certificates. Uh, how could I go about proving it? Um, definitely need to cite it on your, on your resume. And again, if you can get an email from someone you worked with and you screenshot it for us, that would be great. If not, then uh, give as much con you know, detailed contact information as you can in your application materials, so um, if necessary we can follow up. Um, oh, we had a couple of questions about Chinese language. Um, so all scholars, um, you know, the vast majority of Anjing scholars write their thesis in English. And so um, if you are a non-native Chinese speaker, if you're, you know, we recommend that you write your thesis in English. Um, if you are a native Chinese speaker, you do have the option of writing your thesis in Chinese. However, all of your coursework and courses taught at Yanjing Academy will need to be completed in English. If you are a native Chinese speaker and say you take a course in another department at Peking University and that course is taught in Chinese, then of course you just follow the, the uh, regulations of the course. Um, Conversely, if you are a non-native Chinese speaker, um, you have the option of, uh, writing your, of, a, of writing your thesis in Chinese. I would discourage you from that um, in the abstract. That is a very, very, very high bar, um, and you are being evaluated um, not in your native language. Um, so that is an option for you. But I think before you make that choice, um, you should definitely meet with me and consult very, very closely with your advisors at Peking University before you make that choice. There were a couple of other questions we have down um, in the chat and some that were already answered that I want to um, follow up on very quickly because we are getting late. Uh, just to say, Gary, if you, um, it looks like Eric has already dropped off. We appreciate his time. Gary, if you need to um, uh, exit the, the webinar as well, please feel free to. We really appreciate your time and want to be sensitive to it. Um, I'm going to answer a few more questions until maybe 1030 at the latest. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Gary. Okay, so... Um, Okay, we had a question about, okay, um, research methods. Um, so there are courses that you can take in your first year. Uh, qualitative re reasoning is a general elective that will give you research methodology. Um, there are also some qualitative research methods course. There's statistical research methods courses, but also these are all graduate level courses. So in both the China in Transition course, especially the second semester field research course, you will get methodology training. If there is a methodology um, in your field or in another field that you're interested in exploring more deeply, or um, that you think you need to take a course and to strengthen yourself methodologically for your um, master's thesis research, then there will potentially be courses available for you. But another good thing is that you will have an advisor at Peking University or and or Yanjing Academy for both of your years. Uh, you will, you know, we have uh, a system where you select a faculty advisor for your first year in the program. This will take place one month after you arrive at Yanjing Academy. It is a, a mutual selection where we have a, you know, about a 200 PKU professors who are uh, potential faculty advisors. You sign up, you, you select the three, you give your top three most ideal uh, faculty advisors. You submit uh, a few questions, your CV, and then if the faculty of the professor chooses you, then you will be that professor's advisee for the first year. Now, it is possible that, and it's great if your 
first year faculty advisor becomes your thesis advisor, but it's unreasonable for us to expect you to be able to identify a thesis advisor after one month in the program. So there is a second step at the end of your first year where you choose your thesis advisor. Again, the faculty advisor for year one can become the thesis advisor for year two. But the faculty advisor, even if he or she does not become your thesis advisor, this, is, this person is there to help you introduce you to other faculty members and other departments at Peking University to help you adjust to the academic life and the sort of different organizational system here it might be different from your home university or your previous academic experience. Um, and to talk to you about selecting courses, uh, advise you on good courses to choose, uh, to talk to you about your developing ideas on your research project, and if, say, you were interested in a certain kind of theoretical or methodological approach, either that your faculty advisor can point you to professors who are experts in that, in that methodology or that theory, or point you to a course, or if there isn't a course, they can help you find reading so you can work on uh, strengthening your uh, relative academic weaknesses. So that's one of the advantages of the faculty advisor system in the first year. We have a scholar, uh, we have a, a potential applicant um, asked that if a scholar is in their second year at YCA, is it possible to go abroad uh, for exchange for an exchange student program provided by Peking University? Um, yes, it is possible. Um, however, we strongly advise against that um, because um, specifically for international uh, Yanjing scholars. So scholars not from, you know, mainland China or Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan. All of those scholars are required to be in Beijing. Um, I'm going to qualify that in just a second. Um, but if you're an international scholar and you have a fully funded two-year master's program in China, um, I would not recommend that you spend a semester or a second year outside of China. This is a wonderful, perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity to be at Peking University, to um, deeply inter integrate into the Yanjing Academy and the PKU academic community, to get to know Beijing, to get to know China um, by travel and field research. And to me, it just sort of seems like a little bit of a shame that you might take a quarter of your time, your, your two years at, at the Yanjing Academy and at Peking University and not be here. But as a Peking University graduate student, you are allowed to apply for PKU-sponsored study abroad programs. I would strongly recommend before you did that that you would talk to your advisor. Um, you know, in your second year, international scholars do not have to be resident in Beijing. But again, I, I recommend that you do, um, unless you get an internship or unless your research is you know, the transnational or transregional variety, and perhaps you need to be someone else, somewhere else to conduct your research. Um, okay, just wanted to answer that question very briefly. And let me see if there was anything else I wanted to get to. I am thinking that we are about done. Okay, well, we are now just under two hours. So um, as I said, my name is Brent Haas. I'm the Director of Admission Affairs and Distinguished Associate Professor here at Yanjing Academy at Peking University. Thank you very much for your patience and for your attention. Um, if you are interested in some of the other research areas, we already have politics and international relations and law and society posted on our website. I believe uh, my colleague uh, shared the links in the chat function or perhaps in the Q&A earlier, but you can find them on our website. Uh, FYI, the first you know, 30, 45 minutes will be about the same because I did the same presentation and then you will hear from uh, a couple of scholars who applied to and completed their master's thesis in those research areas. Uh, in two days, Wednesday, Beijing time, same time, we're doing, um, a one on the humanities. So we'll have scholars talking from politics or from uh, history and archaeology, literature and culture, and uh, philosophy and religion. So with that, I'm going to say good night from Beijing at 1028 p.m. on uh, Monday. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to see your applications in a couple of weeks. Signing off now. <laughs>